little, my mom used to speak to me about her childhood. She grew up in Stockholm, Sweden in the 70s, and for me it was fascinating to hear her speak about it, because as a child I couldn't fathom the fact that she'd been my age once. And although we looked almost identical in the old photos at my grandparents' house, through her stories, I've come to understand that we grew up in two very different worlds. For example, when she and her family went for rides in the car, her father would be sitting in the front seat, smoking cigarettes with the car windows rolled up, while her and her sister played around in the back seat, no seatbelts on, waving to the cars behind them on the freeway. They would drink soda, and when they were finished, they would roll down the window and throw it out into nature. Now to me, that's, that sounded insane. I had never in my life been allowed to go for a ride in the car without my seatbelt on. And had I dropped even so much as a gum wrapper on the floor, I would have been in a lot of trouble. I went to a Montessori daycare outside of Stockholm, and this is where I learned one of the most important lessons of my childhood, which was to appreciate nature. We were set free for the whole day in the forest to run around, play, explore. And um, it was, uh, for us, littering was unthinkable. And we were taught to always, always leave the forest better than how we found it. For me, I think it was such a privilege to be able to grow up in this way. But unfortunately today, children no longer have this carefree mindset about the future. What inspired me to speak about this as my greenstone was a couple of conversations that I had. And one was with my sister, who is 10. She spoke to me about her feelings of the future, and it struck me that she was so afraid of everything. She was afraid of uh, climate change, rising temperatures, rising sea levels, species going extinct, plastic pollution, just everything. And she felt a deep sense of hopelessness because she believed that anything she could do could never be enough to save the world. This broke my heart. And I don't think that it's right that she has to carry this burden. I've also spoken to a lot of classmates about this, about classes we've taken here at Green School, books we've read, things we've seen on social media that speak about climate change and the future. And what's, what I've seen with these conversations is that almost all information we get about the future is, is fear-based and negative. This is the trend today. Using fear-based fear information intended to alarm people into actions. Phrases such as irreversible climate change, the end of the world, and numerical values of how much time we have left as a society are common. And this all has a very major impact. Eco-anxiety. Now this is a term that's been around for a while, but it's only now starting to become used. The Wikipedia page was created on April 2nd, 2019, or about two and a half months ago. But in 2017, the American Psychology Association published a journal on a similar topic called Our Mental Health and the Changing Climate. In it, there's a quote which says, the psychological effects of climate change, such as conflict avoidance, fatalism, Fear, helplessness, and resignation are growing. Fatalism is the belief that one's actions cannot change the, the destiny of the world. And this is the basis of an argument that many of us have seen in the past or even used ourselves. It's the argument that, well, even if I hadn't bought that water bottle, it still would have been made, so it doesn't really matter. And this is what happens when people come to believe that the issue of climate change is too large and too imminent for any one person to do anything about. It becomes apathy. And this is the exact opposite of what we need. We need people who are inspired, taking charge, and willing to change their habits for the greater good. So how do we make sure that this next generation of children growing up become leaders with values like these? and not become scared by all of this fear-based information that they're constantly fed with. Well, they managed to do something similar to this in Sweden. Between the years of 1970, when my mom was little, and the 2000s, when I was born. Society as a whole went from people mindlessly throwing their trash out into nature to integrating the idea of respect of nature to toddlers. So what is this change that happened? What sparked it? And how can we keep this wave of change going in today's world? 
Well, I spoke to a lot of people about this for my project, and I asked them these questions. And what's interesting is that everyone who grew up in Sweden around the same time as my mom gave me a connecting link. They all gave me a similar answer. What they all remember is an organization called Håll Sverige Rent, or Keep Sweden Clean. Even now, 50 years later, everyone I spoke to remembers its logo. The stylistic representation of three green pine trees reflected into the blue water of a lake. This organization worked to spread awareness to the general population, especially to the kids, and they made it fun. Um, they created advertisements, organized trash picking days, and went to the schools to teach the children about the benefits of recycling and why they shouldn't litter. They made it into a game so that whichever pair of students collected the most litter um, around their area would win. And so condition the kids to associate fun and a feeling of pride with taking care of their surroundings. The children also became a sort of police because they were more informed than their parents. And they would um, tell their parents off if they saw them do something that they'd been taught was wrong, like littering. And these children then grew up to teach their own children what they'd been taught. So, and it worked. Today, in Sweden, taking care of nature by not littering and by recycling is totally integrated into the community. In fact, Sweden is so good at recycling that the government has had to buy trash from other countries in order to burn for central heating. So, Keep Sweden Clean was a major force of change um, in the 70s and until now. And I think that there's one reason why, especially, they were effective. And this is the fact that they used incentive. They made it fun to care about the environment without using guilt or shame. And now the issue of the environment is a complex one. It's the interaction of many things such as politics, economics, geography, and societal norms. And there's not one solution that will save the environment. However, ultimately, what you have to do is you have to appeal to people, not institutions, companies, or governments. And therefore, you need to look at human psychology. What is the most effective way to get someone to change their mind? Well, one of these is incentive. Picture it like this. Imagine you're a child who's been told from the moment they were born that the world is going to end before they graduate college. And there's nothing they can do about it because climate change is already irreversible, and it's too late. Would you feel inspired to fight a battle that you had been told was lost? Or would you become scared and resigned to the fact? I felt, a sim a I felt a feeling similar to this last year when in English class we read a book called Climate Changed. It's a graphic novel by Philippe Scarzoni and it details uh, the author's personal struggle when he finds out about the direness of climate change. In my opinion, this book is so dark. It's full of horrible facts and philosophies about what we're doing wrong as a society, but no solutions. While reading this book, and even afterwards, I felt such a dark feeling of hopelessness that I just tried to shut it out, and I became resigned. And I know that many of my classmates felt the same way. It's my opinion that books like these shouldn't be read in schools. Because school is about informing, yes, but it's not about making kids scared or depressed. And school should be about giving students a clear world view of the world, but it shouldn't be about making them fear that they have no future. And this is what I think Keep Sweden Clean managed to do so well. They managed to be a huge force of change in society, but without using fear tactics. They used positivity. And I think that this strategy, applied anywhere and to anything, will be so much more effective than fear, which from what I've seen is directly damaging and especially to children. I'm going to reference another quote from the American Psychology Association. In particular, stress from climate impacts can cause children to experience changes in behavior, development, memory loss, executive function, decision making, and scholastic achievement. This, to me, sounds very counterproductive to what we're trying to do. And this is not to say that we should veil the truth of the facts from kids because climate change denying and fake news will not get us anywhere. But it's the fact that we need to find a way to talk about it. I say we should always focus on the positives and the progress that we've made, because we have made a lot. 
Think about things such as School Strike for Climate and March for Science, which have only come about in the more recent years. I think also we should highlight the positives and we should speak about the facts that we don't really hear about on the news. So I'm gonna tell you some. Clean energy. It's the most invested in um, energy source in the world right now. With $300 billion being invested in 2018 alone, it's becoming better, cheaper, and more widely available every single year. Plastic bag bans. There's been an increase of this all over the world in the last few years. And I think the fact that we banned them in Bali is a testament to the time we're living in and the change that we're experiencing. This is a map of the world of every country that has either plastic bag ban, tax, or partial ban. And this list is getting added on to every single year. Forests. Today, there's more trees on the earth than there was 35 years ago. And although we do have a long way to go with deforestation, there's reforestation efforts going on all around the world. Just to name one, in Pakistan, one billion trees were planted between the years of 2014 to 2017. It's going on even here in Indonesia, for example in Borneo, which I saw with my own two eyes this year when I went there earlier. So, although we do have a long way to go, there are improvements happening all over the world as we speak. There are people dedicating their lives and so much money to this every single day. And I think this is the message we should focus on and spread to our children. And just as I was taught to leave the forest a little bit better than how I found it when I was little, I hope that I can leave green school just a little bit better with the message to the kids that things are improving and that there are adults fighting for a better world every single day. And with the knowledge that we do truly have a bright future ahead. Thank you.